what's the best imaging for CCI? So is a regular MRI enough? Do I need an upright MRI? Do I need something called DMX or dynamic X-ray? Um, and as you sort of got from the, I believe, I would think the gist is that nobody really knows for sure. And there was a while there that upright flexion extension MRIs sort of became a very common or popular way to look at it. There are still providers. I know Dr. Henderson, one of the CCI surgeons, uh, looks at those. In contrast, Dr. Bolognese, one of the other common CCI surgeons, doesn't rely much on uh, flexion extension and feels that a high quality supine MRI is gonna, and making measurements on that, is gonna be more valuable. So the problem with the open MRIs is that the magnet, the signal that's required to get these pictures for MRIs, it, it's more diffuse. When, as those, for those of you who have had an MRI, I can attest to you, unfortunately, it's a bit of a claustrophobic uh, affair getting an MRI and because you're in this small tunnel and it's tight and that's by design so that the signal could be concentrated. When you're in an upright MRI, it's much better for your claustrophobia and your comfort, but the images, and it depends on the scan, and I've seen scans you know, from certain places and the images are very fuzzy. Uh, and so uh, if, if you're gonna pick one, just getting a high quality uh, so-called three Tesla, uh, Cervical spine MRI is going to be better. Three Teslas has nothing to do with the, the cars, but uh, it's a unit of measurement, and that's the strength of the magnet. And so the upright MRIs are going to be generally one and a half Teslas, uh, so they're going to be uh, weaker. Um, so it all depends. And again, since surgery is going to be the last resort, again, barring some sort of significant and obvious neurologic issue, you know, there's weakness, there's, there's clear damage or injury to the, to the brain stem, you know, which is why we want a good quality MRI to see that a good neurological exam to assess it. Um, you know, surgery should never, or almost never gonna be the first choice. So again, I think the question gets reversed, you know? So again, it's just sort of an, quirk, a quirk of how CCI sort of became, you know, entered into our awareness. Again, it was the neurosurgeons doing this that brought it to, you know, everyone else's attention, devised the criteria for looking at it, set up protocols for assessing it. But again, they're not going to, they're not going to be involved in three quarters or more of you, or at least certainly not at the initial stage. So a lot of people go to the surgeons not because necessarily surgery is what's going to be done next or even ever, but well, very few other people diagnose it. So they, they at least do, they'll provide opinions on it, say, yes, you do have CCI. But again, if the first step's going to be PT, if the second step's going to be different type of PT, if the third step's going to be prolotherapy, then it's not so important having, uh, you know, what test is done initially. Uh, again, an MRI, a routine MRI of the cervical spine is going to let you see the base of the brain. If you've already had an MRI of the brain, that's going to let you see the brain too. You'll know if there's a significant curing or not. You know if there's damage to the um, not damage or compression or, or impact on the brain stem. Um, you can make the measurements or anyone can make the measurements from a good quality MRI of the clival axial angle and some of these other measurements for CCI. Um, DMX, um, most, to my knowledge, the surgeons who do CCI, none of them are, are you know, utilize the DMX. Um, DMX is very interesting. It's a, what we call fluoroscopy, which is basically dynamic X-ray. Um, you know, like when you go through the airport and you see those images and you can see the skeletons walking through, you know, on a screen and the bones are gray, that's fluoroscopy. So um, it's a computerized system and it can make measurements, very detailed measurements of the relationship of each of the vertebrae bones and one another, relationship of the skull on the first vertebrae of the cervical spine. And the problem is, um, 
it's not necessarily standardized. Um, another issue is it seems like the ones I've seen are always abnormal and they're always abnormal in multiple places and they always seem bad. <laughs> it's like the person's neck is, is going to fall apart. And again, maybe that is the selection of the patients who are undergoing these do have more significant problems, but the, the DMX seems to show more problems than what the MRIs show or, uh, and, or even x-rays, regular x-rays. So maybe they're onto something, but again, it gets down to it. There's there's almost no surgeon or no surgeon who's going to fix all of those issues or, or knows how to fix all of those issues. If And we don't know that there's, if it's a surgical issue there. The DMX also came out of the trauma world, came out of whiplash and the idea of somebody's in a car accident and they've sort of torn or damaged the ligament. Again, this is a whole different ball game uh, where ligaments are just more stretchy. And so we don't know if the same paradigm applies. Some of the, those specialized folks who do prolotherapy for CCI or do stem cells for CCI, I believe they use DMX. And so again, I would let the direction you're going with your treatment sort of dictate the study. What do I mean by that? So like if you've got a MRI and at least we know that there's not any significant problems with the base of your brain, with your cerebellum, with your spinal cord, your neurologic exam's okay, then again, you're gonna be PT, PT, PT is gonna be the place to start. Um, some other measures if they're available, like MCU or, or more specialized uh, forms of PT, which I haven't mentioned, like cranial sacral therapy or osteopathic manipulation, again, different things that could help. Um, if you're looking at having prolotherapy, then you know, you would see what that doctor wants, the doctor who's doing it. If they say, well, you know, based on the imaging you had, uh, you know, that's all I need, or I do want DMX, um, usually they're gonna have their preferred facility to do it or their preferred person interpreting it. Um, and so I, I would let them run the show. Um, there's a lot of radiation. I mean, the DMX, you know, you get radiation from it, CT scans, uh, provide a lot of irradiation. Uh, so some people will routinely look for rotational problems. I've talked a lot about cranial cervical instability with the idea that the skull is sort of tipped forward. So we're sort of, uh, you know, horizontally forward and backwards problems. Well, what about, obviously our skull does other things. It, it turns side to side. Sometimes there's something called atlantoaxial insufficiency or AAI. Um, which in my experience is much less common than, than CCI. Um, and so some of these surgeons will advocate doing um, CT scans in rotation. So you, it's a regular CT and then you turn your head to the right and then you take pictures, you turn your head to the left and see if there's an excessive amount of rotation. Again, these numbers, these cutoffs are based on trauma literature and they're based on ideas of, well, if your neck is able to rotate beyond a certain number of degrees, then you're at risk of pinching something called the vertebral artery. So there's two major arteries that go through the back of our brain. And, um, and then they say, well, maybe, you know, we need to fuse or stabilize your, 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 what's called your C1 and your C2. So C2 is like a peg and C1 is a ring that sits over that. And so, um, Sometimes the surgery is not occipital cervical fusion because of CCI, it's, it's, it's fusion for the AAI. Um, again, some surgeons will routinely get the rotational scans, others won't. And um, again, since there's a lot of radiation and since it's, unless again, there's something in neurologic symptoms or neurologic examination that has a, it raises that as a, as a concern that needs to be addressed, you know, before we do other things, before we try PT, before we try manipulation, then I don't know that it's helpful having the information. I mean, certainly, again, when you go from no doctor has found any test that's abnormal, no provider sort of believes that there's something wrong with you, then there's, it's like, well, if there's tests that can show things, why not do them? Uh, I mean, I guess 
there's some merit to that. The problem is, again, sometimes we're fooling ourselves in the sense of, well, okay, so your neck can rotate more than the normal range, but we knew that anyways, because some of you EDSers, hypermobility people are like owls and your neck can be hypermobile. So that gets back to the issue of, well, how do we prove this? And it's hard. And, and in our office, we use something called transcranial Doppler. It's a special type of ultrasound where we can measure blood flow to the brain. And you know we see, okay, well, turn your head this way and that way, and can we demonstrate that the blood flow is being cut off? So sometimes we think that CCI is not a brain issue, not that the brainstem or the cervical spine is being stretched, but maybe blood flow is being impaired. That's a theory. Uh, nobody's conclusively shown that. Like a lot of things, it's very heterogeneous. So some people with EDS, it's an issue. Some people, it's not. Um, we wonder about the opposite, what, what I mean by that. So not that there's not a problem getting blood into the brain, there's a problem getting blood out of the brain. And so in recent years, CCI surgeons and others in the field, other of us in the field, have wondered, well, maybe the problem isn't traction on the brainstem or not solely traction on the brainstem. And the problem is that because of that, slightly the angle being slightly off that clival axle angle and some of the other measurements that blood flow is is getting uh, impeded and there's back pressure and there because there had always been symptoms that we commonly associated with cci head pressure and cognitive issues and brain fog that didn't seem to neatly you couldn't easily explain it with the areas that we were positing were that we were proposing we're getting injured or affected from CCI from a purely mechanical structural issue. So if your ligaments are lax and your cervical spine shift position a little bit, then there can be ways that the internal jugular veins that drain the blood from the vein, from the brain get affected and they can get pinched between certain bumps on the bones and other structures at the base of the skull. And um, it can be intermittent, but enough that it's a problem or cerebral spinal fluid may not, you know, that has to circulate around the base of the brain and go out through that foramen magnum hole. Again, there may not be a Chiari, um, but if, if, if there's a, enough CCI, and again, the CCI can be somewhat dynamic at certain times, if there's, if there's back pressure, uh, maybe that's a factor. So we're, we, we continue to, to, uh, to try to get better tests for this. Um, but just as, you know, 98% of people with hypermobility EDS aren't going to have a carry, um, most people aren't going to have CCI or significant CCI. We really don't know. I don't have a good number for you of what percent have it. it it's certainly not the majority. It's, it's again, a, a certain distinct minority of people with with hypermobility. And then of the people who have CCI, um, it doesn't quote unquote need to be treated. Um, again, as long as there's no damage to the brain or cervical spine tissue on MRI, um, if the neurologic examination is, is, is normal, other tests aren't showing evidence of damage, then we're gonna start, you know, from the basics. And as I said, just hitting those three foundations of the trifecta. So PT um, to help uh, strengthen muscles and get muscles back into better alignment, uh, treating POT uh, if it's present, treating MCAS if it, if it seems to be present. And those, those are gonna, you know, it ain't easy. You gotta find people to do it. Sometimes, again, it's somebody like me who, who does all of those three things, sometimes it's you know, an allergist, immunologist to treat the MCAS, a cardiologist to treat the POTS, a rheumatologist to treat the uh, musculoskeletal issues.